Good morning and welcome to Peak City Church Online. We are so glad you're here to worship with us today. We hope that wherever you're worshiping, you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. So why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet and engage with us in worship. Good morning, Peak City Church. We're so glad that you join us for Church Online. Wherever you are, let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Let's sing our songs to Jesus this morning. Let's continue to worship together. Come on. We need no 
We want the power of Jesus to fall in this place, for him to make himself known here. Let's ask heaven to fall. Shower its blessing over us. The air is changing all around us. As heaven's glory makes an entrance. I feel it in my bones, I feel it on my skin. Heaven's closer than it's ever been.
are worshiping with you this morning. You guys can go ahead and have a seat wherever you are. Hey everyone, now it's time to worship God with our giving. So if you want to, you can go ahead and take your phone out. We've got several ways that you can give in an easy, safe, and reliable way. First thing I would tell you is if you'd like to, you can head over to our website, peakcity.church forward slash give and give there. If you haven't already, you can download the Peak City app and you can give through the app. Or you can even text to give. If you text the word give to 919-373-3131, you can give in an easy, safe, and reliable way through SMS as well. If you don't do any of that digital stuff, that's no problem. Just mail a check in to our PO Box, which is PO Box 723, Apex, North Carolina, 27502. You can make all checks out to Peak City Church. Hey, thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving. It truly has allowed us to shine the light of Christ brightly, to be able to meet needs that a lot of people may not be able to meet because of your generosity. It is making a difference. Well, good morning, Peak City Church. It's so great to be in worship online with you today. I'm Mitch Cartrett. I'm the Next Gen Pastor. And I especially want to say thank you to all of, the, all of you who are first-time guests. That We are honored and privileged that you would actually join us on Church Online today. And we just want to invite you to our website, peakcity.church. There's an online connect card. Maybe you have prayer requests or you want some more information. We would love to follow up with you later this week. Hey, and it's that time of the service where we pull out our cell phone, we maybe log in to Facebook, and we do those Facebook check-ins to Peak City Church. For every check-in, we donate $2 to local food banks, and they're going to help feed displaced kids in the community. So we just want to say thank you for your generosity and your continual check-ins to make a difference in our community. Well, who knows what's happening next Sunday? You got it. We're celebrating Mother's Day next Sunday week on May 10th. Do you want to do something fun for your mom? Well, we want to invite you to record a 10 second video. Grab your kids, grab your family and record a video. It could be fun and creative or maybe you want to be a little more serious and heartfelt. Either way works. You can email that video to office at peakcity.church. Another way that you can celebrate your mom is you can go to our website and you can print off a coloring Mother's Day card for your kids to be able to fill out and color. And also there's an all about me creative fun page for your mom that kids and dads can fill out about your mom. And be sure to print that off and you can celebrate your mom on Mother's Day. We cannot wait to do that with you all next Sunday. Ladies, Mother's Day is coming up soon and Peak City Church wants to celebrate you. So get your best mom outfit together, take a picture, post it to social media with the hashtag Peak City Best Dressed, or email it to office at peakcity.church. The church staff is going to pick a winner for a prize that you are going to want. So the other week we had our very first stay at home date night at Peak City Church. It was a cooking class with Chef Colin Boggs. We all got to bring all the ingredients in our own kitchen and create a Jamaican bean burger. And it was such a hit and a lot of fun that we want to offer another class on May 22nd at 6.30 p.m. So we invite you to register by emailing office at peakcity.church and we'll be sure to get you all the necessary information to join that class. We really enjoyed over the last couple of months just being the church and being generous in our community through our drive-through supply drives. By your generosity, we have really been able to make a difference in our community. And because of that, we want to offer another drive-through supply drive, and that's coming up at Peak City HQ on May 26, from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. So we just want to put that on out there for you guys so that over the next several weeks, you can plan ahead, and as you go to the store, you can grab those supplies, and you'll see that list there as well. So we can't wait to see you on that day. So hey, let's head back to our worship celebration.
Good morning, church family. We're so glad to have you with us here at Church Online. Welcome to Peak City Church. My name's Nate. I'm one of the pastors on staff here and excited that you're joining with us from wherever in the world you are. And don't forget right now, you've got the unique opportunity to invite somebody to church right there where you are. You can grab your phone or grab a device and just invite a friend or two. Send them the link to Church Online. You can say, why don't you join me right now at peakcity.online.church or you can send them uh, the Facebook link uh, or YouTube as well. If you're on Facebook, you can even start a watch party and invite your friends to join you there. So we're excited to have you joining with us for the Waymaker series. If you'd like to catch past messages in this really encouraging series for this time that we're living in right now, why don't you go over to our website at peakcity.church forward slash messages. Man, we are, we're about seven weeks in and sheltering in place here. We do see a light at the end of the tunnel. I praise God for that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords floating around now, like new normal and things. I just want to go ahead and say this is not normal. This is extraordinary. But even in the midst of these extraordinary circumstances, we can still be the church. We can still love well, serve well, be reaching, growing, and sending. And I, I'm so proud of the way that you as a church family have risen to the occasion at, at Peak City right here. In fact, a lot of people have been rising to the occasion to do lots of different and crazy things like cutting their own hair. Uh, in fact, I'm not gonna ask you to do this, like send me emails, but if you're on Facebook, why don't you go ahead and post some pictures of your own self haircuts in the comment section just to have a good laugh here before we get rolling into the message today. If you're a stylist or you're a barber out there, we love you. We cannot wait to be back in your chairs very soon. Praying for that to be able to be a possibility in the days ahead. So that has nothing to do with the sermon today. I just like to laugh a little bit and that makes me chuckle um, when I see people cutting their own hair and their own bangs. <laughs> We're gonna be in the book of John today and in the book of Matthew. So as we've been studying the miracles of Jesus in the book of John, we're in John chapter six and we're gonna be looking at a miracle that you all know really well. To give you context, last week we talked about how Jesus fed the multitudes. He fed the 5,000. And then right after he administered all day, fed this massive crowd possibly of 20,000 people, 5,000 men, plus all these women and children, the Bible tells us that he, he, he dispersed the crowds. And this is what the scripture says. So if you're going to read with me, we're going to start reading in John chapter 6. And then we're going to take a real close look at the Matthew account of the same miracle today. So if you want to go ahead and mark your place in your Bible for Matthew 14 as well, you can do that. All right, so John chapter 6, here's the word of the Lord, starting with verse 16. It says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat, and they started across the sea to Capernaum. Now, it was dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. And the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were frightened. And he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. There it is again. Do not be afraid. And then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. So Jesus tells his disciples, he gets them into a boat and he sends them across the sea to Capernaum. So if you're looking at a map of the Sea of Galilee, looking at the north end of the lake there, basically, they were sailing across the northern tip of the lake from where he fed the multitudes, heading from, from the, uh, the west side of the lake over towards the northeast portion, heading towards uh, Bethsaida. And so in doing that, they get into the boat, they encounter this strong, strong wind. In fact, in the Greek, when it says strong wind, it's not saying just, you know, like a, oh, that's a pretty rough white cap and breeze there. No, the word is megas. It, means, it just means extremely powerful. The Sea of Galilee is actually known for these gales to come up quickly and for the sea that's actually a fairly shallow sea for the most part to get extremely rough with extremely high waves very quickly. And the disciples, they were in the boat sailing and they were in the midst of the storm. Jesus comes to them walking on water. They freak out. He says, do not be afraid. And we see this miracle take place here, Jesus walking on the water. And it happens in three of the gospel accounts. So we see the miracle here in John. It's also in the book of Matthew and in the book of Mark. It's not in the Luke account. But it's interesting to me that Mark's gospel that was, that was actually dictated to him 
by Peter. Peter was just telling Mark what happened. Mark was writing it all down. It doesn't include a, a really what I believe is significant detail about this story, but it's really only included in Matthew's gospel. So I want us to read the Matthew account, and we're really going to lean into this miracle through, through the lens of the Matthew account today for, for good reason. So let's read together. Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 through 31. Verse 28 in Matthew 14 says, And Peter answered him, he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Let's pray together. God, I pray that you would bless your word. I pray that it would draw us nearer to you, that we'd find ourselves much more confident in you these days and much less reliant on ourselves. Speak to us today, and I pray for somebody that, that doesn't know how good you are that's never experienced your salvation or your saving grace, that today they would realize that even though they're in the storm, you're here with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Storms, they happen, right? They're all around us. And there's seasons of life where we're experiencing them where we're kind of moving in them and moving out of them. Uh, and in this particular passage of Scripture, especially here in this Matthew account, we see something very, very telling. You know, if you look at what Matthew's gospel says about the telling of, uh, of this miracle where Jesus walks on the water, and in Matthew 14, 22, if you back up to that verse, it, it says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. So the disciples were following Jesus' commands to get into the boat and go to the other side, and they encountered a storm. And the truth I want you to realize today is, and I hope we see this with very clear eyes now that we're kind of all in a storm all around the world right now with what we've been going through, is that you can be in God's will and experience storms in your life. Because a storm is happening in your life, I want everyone out there that just searches their heart and says, God, is it something that I'm doing that's making this happen? I want you to pause for a second and realize this truth, that you can be walking in God's will and sometimes storms will come into your life. It, it just says it plain as day right there in the scripture. He made the disciples get in the boat and they went sailing into a storm. So you're either heading into them or heading out of them. But in your life, storms happen. And that's the title of today's message, that they are, they're just a part of life that we need to understand that God is either going to be using us to minister to others in the midst of it, or he's going to be teaching us something in the midst of it. But no matter what, we're going to find greater trust in God, whether we're in the storm or worshiping and praising God on the outside of it. We're going to worship him in and out of the storm. You're either heading in or heading out. So when you're in a storm, what do you need? Like, you don't need advice, do you? No, you, you, typically you, you need help. And a lot of people, when you're in a storm, you'd say you need a miracle. Well, the focus of what we want to talk about today is keeping your eyes set on what you need. Because if I read the scripture here and it talks about how Jesus is the God that's got over the storms and he's there in the storms with us, then it tells me that I need to remember the truth about who he is. The Bible, 17 times in the New Testament, shows Jesus saying, I am. He, he's saying that I am the bread of life. He's saying, I am. I am the door. I am the vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. He says, ego, I may. He says in Greek, he says, I am. This is who he is. And so in the midst of a storm, 
You might think you, mean, you need a lot of things, but I just want to stop and say, if your thoughts are that you need anything other than Jesus in the midst of the storm, your eyes are focused on the wrong thing. Because you might be going through it right now like all of us are in different ways. You know, other than just being sheltered in place, you might have just gotten laid off, or you might be coming to the end of that savings, or you might just be accruing a mountain of debt because you're paying for things on your credit cards and don't know how to handle it. I just want to say this, you don't need a job, you need Jesus more than anything in your life. Like, you don't need a plan, you need a person. You don't need a system, you need a savior. You don't need a new goal, you need God. And this is where your foundation of faith will start. And you'll realize that if you have him as your secure and firm foundation, then all these other things will be added unto you. That God will order your steps and you'll see him provide. You'll see him step in in the miraculous ways that you need him to. Because when you're in a storm, most of the time you need a miracle. All the plans in the world were not going to stop the waves and the wind that the disciples were in. They needed Jesus. And I want us to be reminded today no matter what plans look like and no matter how things get unfolded for the government to reopen and states to reopen businesses, no matter what those plans look like, more than anything that you need, you need Jesus. Let's focus on holding on to him because at the end of the day, there's a lot of us out there that may just feel like we're, we're kind of losing our footing. We may feel like Peter, you know, that, that took this big step and all of a sudden, instead of keeping his eyes focused on Jesus when he stepped out of the boat, we find ourselves looking around at problems and issues and circumstances. And so I want us to focus in on this, this amazing detail that Peter seems to have left out of the Gospel of Mark, but shared so beautifully here in the Gospel of Matthew with us in terms of what happened to him when he took a big faith leap, when he decided that he was going to step out of the boat. Because when he did, he got distracted. And when he got distracted, he started to sink. So I wanna give us just some simple things today. I wanna give you five things to help you if you're sinking, all right? So maybe right now your relationships are strained because you've been sheltering in place together. It could be for a lot of people financially, like what we're going through, we feel like we might be sinking financially. Business owners and, and people that may have been furloughed or laid off, you might yourself be sick with the COVID-19 virus and your health is something that you just feel like you're sinking in right now. Uh, or, or even your faith in God is being shaken because you're being so tested through this season. Well, this message is for you today. So I wanna give you some simple tools for you to be able to take steps towards Jesus. Here's what you do when you're in the storm and you feel like you're sinking. The first thing I would say is you need to have courage because of Jesus. Have courage because of Jesus. You know, when I was a kid, I was, I was playing Little League Baseball and we were in the minor leagues in Richmond, Virginia playing Little League and we had this kid on our team and his name was Timmy. And Timmy, was a very large young man. He, he loved to eat, so he's a little bit rotund, big guy. One of the most coordinated kids we had ever seen, though. And every time he stepped into the batter's box, if somebody threw him a strike, he was either gonna drive that thing to the fence or hit it out of the park. He just had a gift. And so most, most, uh, most coaches and kids knew they couldn't strike him out, so what they'd do is they'd either walk him uh, they, he'd get hit by a pitch, uh, or for some reason, they, they'd try to throw him a strike or throw, throw him any pitch, and he'd go after it and hit it, and he'd find a way. Literally, there was a, there was a, a purposed walk. They, they just went to, wanted to go ahead and walk him to first base one time, and the catcher extended his glove out so the pitcher would throw him this really wide pitch on the opposite batter's box of Timmy, and without even stepping outside of his batter's box, he did this huge lean, reached out with his bat, connected with the ball, and sent it over, he was a right-handed batter, sent it over the right field fence. That's how strong he was. And what that meant for us as a team is we knew that whenever he stepped up to the plate, something was gonna happen. And we were actually known in that, that year of minor league baseball as not the, not the Padres. We were known as Timmy's team. And people knew that because we had Timmy on our team, there was a good chance they were gonna lose that game against Timmy's team. I want us to take courage today because we know whose team that we're on. We're not playing on the losing team. Right there from your homes, right there where you're at. Remember that you can take courage not because you've got it in you, not because you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and not because you don't feel fear. By the way, 
You don't need courage if you don't feel fear because that's what courage is. Courage is the ability to stand in the absence of fear. It's doing the right thing in spite of fear. Like if you didn't have fear, you wouldn't need courage in the first place. But just like we knew whose team we were on when we were kids on that minor league baseball team, I want you to remember that you're on the winning team. You can have courage because of Jesus. Now, these disciples, when they saw Jesus, they were terrified. I think that's a very normal response to have when you see a figure walking on the water in the midst of a storm. I mean, for some of us, you know, when it just comes to water in general, you don't like it. Like, there's some of y'all that are so hydrophobic, you want to ask me to baptize you in a life jacket. You know what? Hey, and I'll, I'll, we'll find a way. Like, we'll, we'll do whatever we got to do. But I want you to understand that in the midst of fear, you can have courage because of what Jesus has already done. Like, we're not trying to get through this to the other side together. No, no, Jesus has already brought us through. Don't forget that this world is not your home, and no matter what it looks like, your home is in heaven. You have the hope of glory in Jesus Christ because he won the victory at the cross of Calvary, and that is done. It's not something that we're waiting on. We're not trying to get there to the other side. No, it is done in the name of Jesus. Have courage because he is with you. No matter what circumstances look like in this world, he is with you. The next thing I would say is this. If we want to know what to do when we feel like we're sinking, I would say take a, a faith risk. Why don't you take a risk in faith? And you might say, well, this doesn't feel like the time to do that. Okay, well, I just want you to be encouraged to know that life hasn't been put on pause just because we're doing life differently right now. And you still need to ask God what he would have you do. You still need to ask God what steps of faith he would have you do take like you know this i love this detail that that matthew 14 adds into the story about peter stepping out of the boat in matthew 14 28 it says when peter saw jesus coming and they they realized that they thought it was him it was a ghost and they thought it was jesus because jesus called out and said hey, no it's it's me jesus gets a response from peter and peter says to him he says lord if it's you command me to come to you on the water see you see what this looks like? What, God loves it when we take risks. God loves it when we take risks because they're steps of faith, but they're not blind faith. Like Peter called out to Jesus and he confirmed with God first. Before he stepped out of the boat, he said, Lord, is this something that you want me to do? I wish I could hear an amen shout back at me through the camera right now. Like, you know, if, if some of us would take a moment before we leap to say, Lord, is this a risk that you want me to take and consult him and listen to the Holy Spirit? He will lead you. He will guide you in those steps to be able to take a faith risk. If you feel like you're sinking, sometimes God wants to get you stirred up a little bit by you taking a, a, a leap of faith, a step of faith. But you ask him first. It's not about doubting. It's about confirming God's idea that he's put into your heart. Like you may be thinking about, doing something that you haven't done before, trying to help somebody in a way you haven't helped them. Maybe trying to serve somebody or love somebody in a way that you haven't done that yet. Man, step out and take a faith risk. How about this? How about we all just take a moment to stop giving God our plans and asking God to bless them? Because I feel like we're really, really good at that. Like we love to say, God, here's my plans, bless them. I think it's time to shift away from asking God to bless what we're doing, and it's time to start doing what God is blessing. This is the attitude and the walk that God wants us to have. Like when we're in a storm, we need to realize that it's safer for us to be out of the boat with Jesus than to be in the boat without Jesus. So if God is speaking to your heart in a way that he wants to use you to make an impact in this world right now in the midst of all of this that we're going through, ask him, God, is this what you want me to do? Is this what your plan for me is? And then take a step of faith. Remember the scripture tells us in, in Hebrews eleven six, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Risks please God. They're not foolish tests. A risk is something that you're, you're considering. It, it could go well, it could, it could fail. And you're actually asking God and considering his will for taking that step of faith. But it's not some blind faith thing. It's not like you're stepping up to the roulette wheel going, come on, number seven, right? You're not, you're not just going to be wasting time, energy, and effort. You're actually taking a, a, a risk that's calculated and considered and prayed through. And it honors God. You need 
to get out of the boat. This isn't a foolish test you're putting God to. This is something that you're doing in faith. You're going to step out in the areas of your life you feel challenged to. And some of you say, well, I don't even know where to start with that. Like, what kind of risk could I possibly take? Well, how about this? Why don't you start by stepping out in the areas that he's already told you to that you're not? How about that? How about that secret sin that's going on in your life? How about you take a step of faith to say no more? In the name of Jesus, I'm not gonna allow that to have its grip on me anymore. Maybe, maybe you know that you're supposed to forgive. The scripture tells us that we've been forgiven much and so God expects us to forgive much as well. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you have not forgiven and it's a huge faith leap for you to forgive that person whether they care you forgive them or not, it's not about them as much as about what God is going to do to heal your heart when you take a step to forgive someone. Maybe, maybe in the midst of all this financial uncertainty, you haven't been honoring God by returning to him what belongs to him first. Maybe you need to take a step and start tithing. Maybe that's, that's a faith leap that you need to take that you're not taking right now. And God would say, in the midst of your sinking, why don't you keep your focus on me? Why don't you take a risk, a leap of faith, and trust me to provide for you? Because when you give God what belongs to him first, he will bless the rest. He will provide for what you need. Maybe you need to take that kind of step of faith today. Maybe you need to share your faith. You've never been in a better position to share your faith with your neighbors than you are right now. You've never been in a better position to invite somebody to hear the gospel than right now when it's so easy. It's right there at your fingertips. Maybe you need to take a step today to say, I'm gonna share my faith with somebody. I'm not gonna hold that in anymore but it takes a step of faith. I'll just say it to you this way. Do you wanna walk on water? You gotta get out of the boat. That's what you gotta do. So I wanna encourage you with that today. Here's the next thing. If you feel like you're sinking, why don't you stay focused on Jesus? And we talked about this at Easter, refocusing our faith. This is so important because the moment you take your eyes off of Jesus, you're going under. This is true for Peter, and it's true for you. Verse 30 in Matthew 14, it says, but when he, Peter, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. He started looking at the wind and the waves and beginning to sink, because as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. And whenever we focus more on the things that are happening to us than the God that is seeing us through, then we're gonna find ourselves sinking. I'll say it to you this way, distressed, depressed, or at rest. It all depends on what you focus on. Where have you fixed your eyes? You've gotta keep your focus on Jesus. And here's how you know that. Here's how you know that you've taken your focus off of Jesus in the big picture sense, and it's subtle. When people ask you, how are you doing? And you give them a response instead of just doing the typical fine or good, you know? Good meaning I'm, I'm really doing okay. Fine meaning I'm doing terrible, but I don't want to talk about it. Like if you go beyond that in conversation and you actually tell somebody how you're doing and you say something like, I'm okay under the circumstances. That's a detector right there of where your mind's really at under your circumstances? No, no, no. You're not supposed to be under any circumstances because God has pulled you out of the pit so that you are above circumstances. The Bible tells us that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. The Bible tells us that in Romans chapter eight. And that's a truth for you today. Remember that when your focus is off, you are going to sink. You gotta keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. As soon as Peter took his eyes off of him, he started going down, and the same is true for you. So if you want to change your life, change your focus. If you don't, if, listen, if you've never had a relationship with God, and you're just watching this morning because this looked like a more fun option than terrible Sunday morning television, hey, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're with us. And if you want to change your life, you got to allow God to do it. And it starts by changing your focus. You gotta fix your eyes on Jesus. This is true for someone that's a Christ follower. This is true for someone that's not. If you, if you spend more time consuming media than you do spending time with God, you're sinking. The truth is this, that God is, is, is wanting to have a relationship with you and the time that you spend with him is food for your soul. So what are you consuming more than you are 
spending time in his word and spending time with him. And spending time being the loving neighbor, the loving spouse, the loving father, friend, son, daughter, that person that's making an impact in this world, when you're spending more time consuming things that are on Netflix or just constant, constantly glued to 24-7 news, I'm telling you, you are gonna find yourself sinking. Engage in your relationship with God. Stay focused on Jesus. So the next thing I would tell you, it's just, just don't doubt. Now, I'm not saying don't doubt anything ever. What I'm saying is, don't doubt God's ability. Don't doubt Jesus. Don't doubt your faith. I mean, you're gonna believe your beliefs. Doubt your doubts, but believe your beliefs. Matthew 14, 31, it says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and he took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith. I love that. He's, he didn't say, oh, you of no faith. He reached out to Peter and said, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? He says this to Peter. He says this, this thing about little faith. He's not talking about faithlessness. What he's doing, Jesus is showing us that you can do exceedingly and abundantly beyond anything that you could ever ask or think could be done in this world just with a little faith. If you'll put all of that little faith in Jesus. It doesn't matter how big or small your faith is. It's not about how big or small your faith is. It's about how big your God is. And he is able to do far more than you ever could with the little that you give him. Remember last week when we shared about this miracle of the fishes and loaves, man, five small little pieces of bread, two small pieces of fish, but it's what they had. And when they offered Jesus what they had, he said, little is much when I am in it. And he multiplied something in ways no one ever thought possible. And in the same way with you and what little faith you think you have, if you'll stop trying to put it in yourself or in your spouse or in your kids or in your job or in the economy or in this administration or in the last one or whatever, if you'll take what little faith you have and you'll put it all in Jesus, he will do something extraordinary. In the midst of your storm, he will be the miracle that is seeing you through. But it's all about us putting what faith we have in Jesus. We're all born with faith. You may not think this, but it's the truth. You, you just put your faith in different places. You know, people say, uh, you know, they, they don't believe in God. They're atheists, and they say they just believe in science. Okay, well, the scientific theory is constantly correcting itself. And so for so many people, we say, no, this is right because this is what the scientific theory says until it doesn't. And they say, well, this is right because this is what the scientific theory says until it doesn't. And they, listen, that's a massive step of faith to continue saying, well, okay, every time we're corrected, I'm putting my faith in this thing being right. Or like when you get on a plane to fly, you're putting faith in the fact that the pilot is gonna get you safely from point A to point B, right? You're putting your faith in someone all the time. If I were to sit in a chair, I'm putting my faith in that chair that it can hold my weight. And I'm a big guy, so it needs to be a sturdy chair, if you know what I'm saying. But I'm putting my faith in something. What I'm encouraging you to do is to put it all in Jesus. So if you're sinking, stop putting your faith in the wrong places. Start putting it all in him. The last thing is this. If you're sinking, you need to praise God. If you're sinking, especially for you believers out there, you, you just need to spend some time doing what you were made and created to do. You praise God in the storm. You praise God out of the storm. Like when this passes, you celebrate and worship Jesus like you're worshiping and holding on to him right now. Verse 32, Matthew 14, it says, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped him, worshiped Jesus saying, truly you are the son of God. They worshiped him. Some of us, we lose sight of this. We just think that God is this person we come to to try to get him to do what we want. No, no, no. We are the sheep of his pasture. And God's calling us to draw near to him, to love him, to hear him, and to obey him. Now check this out, this, this account that we see in, in John's telling of the miracle here in verse 21 of John chapter 6. It says, then they were glad to take Jesus into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. 
I want to ask you this question. Are you trusting Jesus in this storm to get you to your final destination? Because the Bible tells us this, that there's a promise that the road to heaven is, is narrow and that we can only get there by trusting Jesus. In fact, Romans 1.17 says, the good news tells us how God made us right in his sight. And this is accomplished really from start to finish by faith. The Bible tells us, you know, it's through faith that a righteous person has life. So, so how then? How do we come to God in faith? I want to give you the simplest way to tell you this that I can, I can think of right now. And it was something that I learned from a pastor, an incredible guy out in, in California. So Pastor Rick, thank you for teaching this to me as I, as I share this simple thought with anyone that's watching today. If you want to come to God in faith, if you want to give your life to Jesus if you want to ask him to make you new, if you want to ask him to forgive your sins, if you want to ask him to be your Lord and Savior, if you want to know with all certainty that whenever you leave this world, maybe a long, long time from now, that you'll step out of this life into eternity in heaven with Jesus, then I just want to give you some simple steps to take. And it's as simple as A, B, C, and D. A, you need to admit that you need a Savior. Admit that you need a Savior because you can't save yourself and you can't get to God on your own. I mean, we have to realize, you know, I'm a sinner. I've blown it. Heaven is perfect and I am not. And I need a savior. So ad admit that you need a savior right now, wherever you are. Why don't you just, if you're ready to take a step of faith to give your life to Jesus, you can click the button that says, I wanna raise my hand to give my life to Christ. And you can take a step and just tell Jesus, hey, God, I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. So admit that you need a savior. B, believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Acts 16, 31 tells us that. You believe that Jesus is who the Bible says that he is and you trust him with everything that you have. You believe that he is the one that can forgive sin. Believe that he died on the cross for you as a sacrifice to pay for all the sins of this world and that three days later he rose to life again. So A, you admit. B, you believe. And then C, confess, confess your sin. Tell God that you're sorry for what you've done wrong and then repent. You say, well, what is repentance? That's when we turn away from our sin. We say, you know what? I'm turning away from that old life. I'm not living that way anymore. With your spirit living in me, I'm gonna live a new way. I'm gonna live for you, Jesus, not for my old desires. I'm not living for sin anymore, but I'm living for you. That's what repentance is. That means you're turning from your sin. Admit, believe, confess, and then D, depend. Depend upon God's promise. John 3, 16 says it this way. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This, this is the gospel. This is the gospel talking about a God that doesn't stand on the shoreline telling us what to do. No, no, no. This is the gospel that says he gets out on the water and he comes and meets us. He meets us in our pain. He meets us in our fear. He meets us in our depression. He meets us in our storm. He meets us in our discouragement. He comes to us. What a God we serve. Can we pray together? Hey, if that's you today and you wanna take those steps of faith to receive Christ, I can't encourage you enough to let somebody know. You can click that button that says, I'm making a decision to follow Jesus or email us at office at peakcity.church and tell us what God's doing in your life. But if that's you today and you wanna be included on this prayer, you let us know that you're making a decision to follow Jesus today. Let's pray together. God, for everybody that's under the sound of my voice right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak. And for those that are ready to take a step to receive you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that they would admit that they need a Savior. They would tell you in their own words right now how they need you. That they would believe that you are God. And that they would put all their faith, no matter how small or big that is, in you. That they would confess their sins and say, God, I'm a sinner and I, I need you to forgive me. And I'm walking away. I'm turning away from that sin. Thank you for forgiving me. And that they would depend upon your promise. That you're faithful. That you died to save us and that you rose again. And because you rose again to life, you can raise us to life again. And so I pray for everyone that's taken a step of faith to receive you, that you would put a new spirit within them, just like you promised to in your word. And that as we're new creations today, that we can all celebrate together in the family of God with some new members of your family 
because you've rescued souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us for online church today. We would love to connect with you. Please head over to peakcity.church and fill out our online connect card. And if God has laid it on your heart to support the ministry of Peak City Church, please head over to peakcity.church forward slash give. Thanks so much for joining us and have a fabulous week.